A Burlesque Biography by Mark Twain. Two or three persons having at different times intimated that if I would write an autobiography, they would read it when they got leisure. I yield at last to this frenzied public demand and herewith tender my history. Ours is a noble house and stretches a long way back into antiquity. The earliest ancestor of the Twains have any record of was a friend of the family by the name of Higgins. Well, this was in the 11th century, when our people were living in Aberdeen, county of Cork, England. Why, it is that our long line has ever since borne the maternal name except when one of them now and then took a playful refuge in an alias to avert foolishness, instead of Higgins, is a mystery which none of us has ever felt much desire to stir. It is a kind of vague, pretty romance, and we leave it alone. All the old families do that way. Now, Arthur Twain was a man of considerable note, a solicitor on the highway in William Rufus's time. At about the age of 30, he went to one of those fine old English places of resort called Newgate to see about something and never returned again. Well, there he died suddenly. Now, Augustus Twain seems to have made something of a stir about the year 1160. He was as full of fun as he could be and used to take his old saber and sharpen it up and get in a convenient place on a dark night and stick it through people as they went by to see them jump. Oh, he was a born humorist. But he got to going too far with it, and the first time he was found stripping one of these parties, the authorities removed one end of him and put it up on a nice high place on Temple Bar where it could contemplate the people and have a good time. He never liked any situation so much or stuck to it so long. Then, for the next 200 years, the family tree shows a succession of soldiers. Noble, high-spirited fellows who always went into battle singing, right behind the army, and always went out a-whooping, right ahead of it. This is a scathing rebuke to old dead Frisart's poor witticism that our family tree never had but one limb to it, and that that stuck out at right angles and bore fruit winter and summer. Now, early in the 15th century, we have Beau Twain called the Scholar. He wrote a beautiful, beautiful hand, and he could imitate anybody's hand so closely that it was enough to make a person laugh his head off to see it. Now, he had infinite sport with his talent, but by and by he took a contract to break stone for a road, and the roughness of the work spoiled his hand. Still, he enjoyed life all the time he was in the stone business, which, with inconsiderable intervals, was some 42 years. In fact, he died in harness. During all those long years, he gave such satisfaction that he never was through with one contract a week till the government gave him another. He was a perfect pet, and he was always a favorite with his fellow artists, and was a conspicuous member of their benevolent secret society, called the Chain Gang. Now, he always wore his hair short, had a preference for striped clothes, and died lamented by the government. He was a sore loss to his country, for he was so regular. Now, some years later, we have the illustrious John Morgan Twain. He came over to this country with Columbus in 1492 as a passenger. Now, he appears to have been a crusty, uncomfortable disposition. He complained of the food all the way over and was always threatening to go ashore unless there was a change. He wanted fresh shad. Well, hardly a day passed over his head that he did not go idling about the ship with his nose in the air, sneering about the commander and saying he did not believe Columbus knew where he was going, or he'd ever been there before. Now the memorable cry of Land Ho thrilled every heart in the ship but his. He gazed a while through a piece of smoked glass at the penciled line lying on the distant water, and then said, Well, land be hanged, it's a raft. When this questionable passenger came on board the ship, he brought nothing with him but an old newspaper containing a handkerchief marked BG, one cotton sock marked LWC, one woolen one marked D.F., and a nightshirt marked O.M.R. And yet during the voyage, he worried more about his trunk and gave himself more airs about it than all the rest of the passengers put together. Now, if the ship was down by the head and would not steer, he would go and move his trunk further aft and then watch the effect. Now, if the ship was by the stern, he would suggest to Columbus to detail some men to shift the baggage. Now, in storms, he had to be gagged because his wailings about his trunk made it impossible for the men to hear the orders. The man does not appear to have been openly charged with any gravely unbecoming thing, but it is noted in the ship's log as a 
curious circumstance that, albeit he brought his baggage on board, of the ship in a newspaper, he took it ashore in four trunks, a Queensware crate, and a couple of champagne baskets. But when he came back insinuating in an insolent, swaggering way that some of his things were missing and was going to search the other passenger's baggage, it was too much, and they threw him overboard. They watched long and wonderly for him to come up, but not even a bubble rose on the quietly ebbing tide. But while everyone was most absorbed in gazing over the side, and the interest was momentarily increasing, it was observed with consternation that the vessel was adrift, and the anchor cable hanging limp from the bow. Then in the ship's dimmed and ancient log, we find this quaint note. In time it was discovered, yet ye troublesome passenger had gone down and got the anchor, and took ye same and sold it to ye damn savages from ye interior, saying yet he had found it, ye son of a gun. Yet this ancestor had good and noble instincts, and it is with pride that we call to mind the fact that he was the first white person who ever interested himself in the work of elevating and civilizing Indians. Now he built a commodious jail and put up a gallows, and to his dying day he claimed with satisfaction that he had more restraining and elevating influence on the Indians than any other reformer that ever labored among them. Now at this point the chronicle becomes less frank and chatty and closes abruptly by saying that the old voyager went to see his gallows perform on the first white man ever hanged in America, and while there he received injuries which terminated in his death. The great-grandson of the reformer flourished in 1600 and something, and was known in our annals as the Old Admiral, though in history he had other titles. He was long in command of fleets of swift vessels, well armed and manned, and did great service in hurrying up merchantmen. Vessels which he followed and kept his eagle eye on always made good fair time across the ocean. But if a ship still loitered in spite of all he could do, his indignation would grow till he could contain himself no longer. And then he would take that ship home where he lived and keep it there carefully, expecting the owners to come for it. But they never did. And he tried to get the idleness and sloth out of the sailors of that ship by compelling them to take invigorating exercise in a bath. He called it walking the plank. All the pupils liked it, and at any rate, they never found any fault with it after trying it. When the owners were late coming for their ships, the admirable always burned them so that the insurance money would not be lost. Well, at last, this fine old tar was cut down in the fullness of his years and honors. And to her dying day, his poor heartbroken widow believed that if he'd been cut down 15 minutes sooner, he might have been resuscitated. Now, Charles Henry Twain lived during the latter part of the 17th century and was a zealous and distinguished missionary. He converted 16,000 South Sea Islanders and taught them that a dog tooth necklace and a pair of spectacles was not enough clothing to come to divine service in. His poor flock loved him very, very dearly. And when his funeral was over, they got up in a body and came out of the restaurant with tears in their eyes and saying to one another that he was a good, tender missionary. They wished they had some more of him. Pa Gotawa Pukatenis, mighty hunter with the hog eye twain, adorned the middle of the 18th century and aided General Braddock with all his heart to resist the oppressor, Washington. It was this ancestor who fired 17 times at our Washington from behind a tree. So far, the beautiful romantic narrative in the moral storybooks is correct. But when that narrative goes on to say that at the 17th round, the awe-stricken savage said solemnly that man was being reserved by the great spirit for some mighty mission, and he dared not lift his sacrilegious rifle against him again, the narrative seriously impairs the integrity of history. What he did say was, It ain't no, no use. A man's so drunk he can't stand still long enough for a man to hit him. I can't afford no full way of any more ammunition on him. Well, that was why he stopped at the 17th round. And it was a good, plain, matter-of-fact reason, too. And one that easily commends itself to us by the eloquent, persuasive flavor of probability that there is about it. I also enjoyed the storybook narrative, but I felt a marring misgiving that every Indian at Braddock's defeat, who fired at a soldier a couple of times, too, easily grows into the 17th in century, and missed him, jumped to the conclusion that the great spirit was reserving that soldier for some grand mission. And so I somehow feared that the only reason why Washington's case is remembered and the others forgotten is that in his the prophecy came true, and in that of the others it didn't. There are not books enough on earth to contain the record of the prophecies that Indians and other unauthorized parties have made. 
but one may carry in his overcoat pockets the record of all the prophecies that have been fulfilled. Now I'll remark here in passing that certain ancestors of mine are so thoroughly well known in history by their aliases that I have not felt it worth while to dwell upon them, or even mention them in the order of their birth. Among these may be mentioned Richard Brinsley Twain, alias Guy Fox, John Wentworth Twain, alias Sixteen String Jack, William Hogworth Twain, alias Jack Shepherd, Anias Twain, alias Baron Munchausen, John George Twain, alias Captain Kidd, Oh, and then there are George Francis Twain, Tom Pepper, Nebuchadnezzar, and Baum's Ass. They all belong to our family, but to a branch of it somewhat distinctly removed from the honorable direct line. In fact, a collateral branch, whose members chiefly differ from the ancient stock, in that in order to acquire the notoriety we've always yearned and hungered for, they've gotten to a low way of going to jail instead of getting hanged. It is not well when writing an autobiography to follow your ancestry down too close to your own time. It is safe to speak only vaguely of your great-grandfather and then skip from there to yourself, which I now do. I was born without teeth, and there Richard III had the advantage of me, but I was born with a humpback likewise, and there I had the advantage of him. Now my parents were neither very poor nor conspicuously honest. But now a thought occurs to me. My own history would really seem so tame contrasted with that of my ancestors that it's simply wisdom to leave it unwritten until I'm hanged. Well, if some other biographies I've read had stopped with the ancestry until a like event occurred, it would have been a felicitous thing for the reading public. Now, how does it strike you? <laughs>